Uh, and Jack is going to teach tonight because we went through this yesterday. So, but um, so good. Only three verses, you know. Only three verses. One of the songs of the ascents. Uh, but gosh, how powerful in these three verses. Uh, when you, as you're turning there, be understanding that this, the psalm was written by David. Uh, and it's, it's one of the Psalms of the Ascent, which are those psalms that they would sing as they would be going up the mountain to, to worship the Lord. And it's suggested by some commentators, you know, there's, there's two takes on it, and then there's my take on it, which is probably many others as well. But some believe straight out, well, this is talking about when David was being hunted down uh, by Saul, and uh, being accused by Saul of trying to take over the throne when David was not. He was, he was anointed for the throne, but it would be handed to him. It would be given to him. And so it wasn't a, a time of David lift, trying to lift himself up and uh, that he's accused of by Saul. And we know that, and that's why Saul wanted to kill him. But as what, he was just threatened by him. It's kind of like we talked about on Sunday morning how Jesus, so many times, he's a threat, He's a threat to the enemies of God. And so that's one take, that it was David being hunted down by Saul and his kind of justifying himself in the place of where he was really at. The other is his response to his wife, Michael, when the, if you remember when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought back into the, to the city, to Jerusalem, and it, we're told that, that David danced naked before the Lord, and he wasn't dancing naked, okay, just by the way, just so you know, get that picture out of your mind, but it was, uh, it was more that he was kind of dancing in his undergarment, and just, he was delighting in God, and, uh, and, and at the same time, Michael, his bride, his wife, was accusing him of being crazy, going too far, uh, being undignified, you could say. And, uh, and you think about it, when you, when you look at worship, uh, there is, in our world today, probably always has been, we know, even from our studies in First and Second Kings and stuff, there is, there is worship that is undignified when it is about self, or it's to other gods, or it's for others to see. Uh, but there is no, there's nothing undignified about worship when it's just worship given to God. When your heart, you're in love with Him, and you're singing out, and you're blessed. And I remember once, you know, years ago, we were going to a church, and, and uh, there was a, a gal there in the church that sang very loud and very off-key. And... Uh, and there was, we were at a, at a leaders meeting kind of thing, and, and uh, somebody there was commenting on that and how, oh my gosh, you know, it's like, and I was just like, I mean, and I'm looking, I'm thinking, you know, I didn't, I didn't say it, you know, but I think, who's going to stand up for this? this? This gal loves the Lord with all her heart, with all her soul, with all her, her voice. And, and just because she doesn't have a good voice doesn't mean that her worship wasn't good. Nothing undignified, you know, because it was, it was pure and it was holy. And, and so those are the two takes. It's, it's either David was being chased down by Saul or David was uh, being accused by his, uh, by his bride because of being undignified. But the bottom line is this. We don't know for sure, but we know that with David's life, when you, when you were a servant of the Lord, you're... Opposition is just, you know, kind of, you know, comes with the territory. And you're going to be spoken of against. You're going to be accused of things. And, and it just comes with the territory. And when you think about this psalm here, as David writes this psalm, you know, we don't know when it was in his life. So that's how we can't, we can't assign it to any specific matter. But, but we know that, gosh, David is a guy who... As a king, he suffered and went through so many things. He had, again, his wife, Michael, that, you know, was, that was a bummer. And then, he, and then he took another wife, and that was a bummer for the start. But the Lord, you know, amazingly blessed after that. I mean, talk about grace. I mean, talk about grace in that part of the story. It's not taught often. But the end of it is this. David had sons. He had daughters. 
he had a family that was divided against itself as well. He's trying to run a whole nation, you know, and so he's going to be accused over and over, and that's exactly what happened here. But I love the one line in this that's, that's put as a subtitle in my Bible for this Psalm 131, a song of the ascent of David, is the one line that's taken from it is, I have calmed and I have quieted my soul. You know, there's, there's, when it comes to the calming and the quieting of our souls, uh, when it comes to being accused and we need to calm down, when it comes to the calming and quieting of our souls, when, when it comes to hurts and pains and trials of life, which David suffered many, uh, we need to understand we take part in that. The Lord is the one that brings the calm to the storm and the quiet to the soul, but, but we, we take part in it, in receiving it. And so uh, with that, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll jump in here to Psalm 131. And we'll be back in Numbers uh, next week. Father, we come before you, and again, we ask you, Lord, to, to, to calm and to quiet our souls, God, maybe in areas that we need could be areas of accusation, could be just great things of confusion that are too big for us to handle and understand. And even as a king, we can understand he was only a man. And so, God, we ask you, Jesus, tonight, Father, pour out your Spirit on us to prepare us and to use us and to help us to be an example, even as David was and is in this psalm. And we ask you in our own lives, Lord, be glorified. Have your way in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a quick side note. That, that song, you know, This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart I worship you. I, I'd heard it before, you know, many times. Sung it before many times. And I forget where we were. I think maybe we were on Kauai. I think we were on Kauai at a pastor's prayer retreat thing or something like that. But uh, there's this guy, Teva who is a local boy from Molokai who was a worship leader over there at Calvary Chapel Molokai when they first started many, many, many years ago and uh, with Waxer Tipton. And, um, and Teva was at this thing, and I, I think it was there, and he had his guitar out, and he, and he just started playing that song. And it was so sweet and real and good and amazing because... It was, he wasn't just singing the song. He was expressing his desire to honor God that with all his heart, he'd worship him. You know, it's like, it, it was so sweet. And ever since then, it's like that song has meant a lot to me. And, and here's the thing. Many of these psalms, as we go through this one, we need to remember these are psalms that were songs. They, they were sung as they would go up the mountain. The, 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 the first of the psalms of the ascent is sweet. It's in Psalm 120 where the, the song be, begins, In my distress I called on the Lord and, and, and He answered me. You guys, you guys, that's enough right there. You know, you could go through the rest of the psalm and it's great. Don't turn there. Don't do it now. But in my distress I called to the Lord and He answered me. You guys, if you have a relationship with God in your distress, you can call on Him. When we look and we go on to the very last of the Psalms of the Ascent, in Psalm 1, uh, 134, there it is. Sweet. They would sing this. Again, remember, they would sing these Psalms as they're going up the mountain to Jerusalem for the feast, as they've been traveling for, some of them, hundreds of miles. And then as they get to the, the foot of the mountain, as they start going up the mountain, the Psalms of the Ascent, they would be singing. And this is the last one of them, and I don't know that it would be the last one as they enter the city, but so sweet. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Those of you who stand by night in the house of the Lord, Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Again, a psalm that we sing often. It's one of my favorites. Come bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. You guys, that should be the desire of every servant's heart, to bless the Lord. 
I mean, you think about, you know, the pictures that we, po- that we paint and that the Lord has painted of, of marriage in, in, as a picture of Christ and the church, but a husband and his bride and how, how the bride is a, a picture of the church. And, and then you go to that place of intimacy is a part of marriage between a husband and a wife. And there's, listen, intimacy that is a part of, of the relationship with God and his, his, his bride, the church, each and every one of us. And it's not an intimacy as you experience in marriage, but it's higher and loftier and more lovely even still. It's the purest of pure. It's a place of giving of yourself wholly and completely to God. And you guys, in these Psalms, we're reminded of that. And here, in the midst of this one, what is it that God would want to do for his bride? He wants to calm our hearts. You know, any, any husband here knows, you know, if, you're, if your bride is in a place where she's worried and she's afraid or whatever, you want to do everything you can to enter in and to help and to calm and to quiet her soul. And so we get some insight into that here. And again, not just for husbands and their brides, but for every one of us, because these songs that they would sing on the way up to Jerusalem, to the temple, you know, they're, they, to me, they, in a sense, they point to where we are at today. We, where, well, where are we at, Steve? Well, you know, here, you know where we're at? I believe you just look at the news and you would find out that we are on our way up. We are on our way up. We are on our way. We, we know that that place of the, of the culmination of, of, of all the things of God is coming soon. And the bride is going to be joined together with the bridegroom. As they would go up the mountain, they would be anticipating the sacrifices and the worship and, and literally seeing, to see the sacrifice as it was there. They would be, there would be guys, there would be those that would be men that have, have come from far away and they know that they've sinned. And they know that they need their sins forgiven. They know they need their sins covered. And they're bringing their sacrifice with them, a little lamb or a goat. Or maybe they bring in a bull for a burnt offering, something huge, you know, because of the guilt that they feel for a guilt offering. And as they would be walking up that mountain, they'd be anticipating that laying on of their hands on that sacrifice that they're bringing with them. This animal that they've raised and, 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 and cared for and and they're, bringing, they're anticipating that laying of their hands on the sacrifice and then giving it to be slaughtered as a sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. You guys, it was an intense time. It was, it, was, it was a time for us, you guys, or it will be, I should say, a time for us. The sacrifice has already been made. And it's greater than any amount ever of bulls and lambs and rams and goats, any offering ever. But the Son of God, our sacrifice, you guys, as we, as we get to that height, as we, as we come to the culmination of, of God's plan for our lives, as the bride gathers together and we see Jesus, to see that sacrifice, to the, see the one that, in a sense, that, that took us and, and he took our place. And, and then this, to understand this, the thought of, you know, well, that surely whenever there was a sacrifice made that the hand of the one sacrificing would be placed upon that, that, that sacrifice, picturing the transference of guilt and their identification with that one. So as the father gave the son, he could not, he could not identify with guilt because he was pure and he was whole, just as his son was pure and was whole as a sacrifice. He was sinless. But the father surely put his hand on the son, acknowledging and identifying himself with the son as the son of God died for all men. And it blows my mind when I think about it, you guys. We're on our way to that place where we are going to see the son, Jesus, face to face. We're going to understand what fellowship with the father really is in its fullness. What we've tasted, what we've known to degree. You know, the Spirit is the Spirit. We're not going to all of a sudden see the Spirit, but we are going to experience and understand the Spirit in ways that we never have. And again, it, it, how does it happen? We've got to climb the mountain. We've got to climb the mountain. We've got to make our way up. And these Psalms of the Ascent, it just reminds me again of where are we at today? We're on our way up. Listen, in, in, in Psalm, or I'm sorry, not in Psalms, in Ephesians chapter 5, 
In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Let me set the stage real quick. In Ephesians chapter 5, you know, Paul is speaking to the Ephesians of love and walking in love. And he tells them that, hey, you guys are, you are now light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Because you are children of the light, walk that way. Discern, I love it in verse 10, discern what is pleasing to the Lord. That's what we should be thinking. When we get up, as we go about our day, as we are making our way up the mountain of life, in a sense, to the day that we stand before the Lord, what can we do? Can we, we need to discern what is pleasing for the Lord. Not taking part in unspiritual works of darkness, instead exposing them. And again, interesting, you know, so many, you know, even in the church, it's like, hey, well, I'm, I, don't want, I don't take part in that. But, you know, I'm not going to talk about it. I don't want to expose it. It's like, you know, I mean, it's what we're called to do. You know, we're called to be those stand up and our watchmen. And, and, uh, but he goes on to say, in, in, in speaking in verse 13 there, look at chapter 5, verse 13, if you've turned there. It says, but when anything expo is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. So there's light. It's visible. There's light. And for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. In other words, you know, it's like, it's light out. Don't pull the covers over you. You know, don't, but, but embrace it. Awake, O sleeper. And he's speaking, remember, as those words are prophetic, pointing forward, Paul is now using them for the church, and he's saying, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. I think there are many within the church today, and we've all been there before, Asleep when we should be awake. Arising from the dead. Not looking like, not a, not a living, breathing, born again believer that looks like the world, but one that, that looks different, that is, has been born again. Arise from the dead. And that Christ is not only shining on, but then shining through. And every one of us wants that, you could say. That, I mean, we do, if you don't, then, then I don't know if you're a Christian. But, but if you're a Christian, you want God's God's light to shine on you. You want to be awake to the things of God. But here's the thing. To have Christ's light shine on you, you have to wake up. And I think that that's the place a lot of people need to come to. They need to look carefully then how they walk. Look at verse 15. We're walking our way up to verse 19. Look carefully then how you walk. You know, we need to watch out. Not as unwise, but as wise. Here it is. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. You know, with the time that we have in, our, in this walk that we have, we need to make good use of it, understanding we have a short time. Therefore, and it's evil, there's evil times. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Here it is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, that is a waste, but be filled with the Spirit. Pretty clear here, you know. I mean, many times the Lord warns us and calls us to that place of being filled with the Spirit and warnings against those things that will take us away from the Spirit. But how do you do that? And what will happen if you will? Verse 19, okay? Addressing one another in Psalms. You know, just what we're seeing this evening. I mean, so how do you address one another in Psalms? Well, first off, you know, you just like, for, for, for Christ to, to shine on you, you've got to wake up to address one another with psalms. Well, you need to have a life that is understanding the psalms. I mean, I tell you, there's 151 of, 150 of them, and they're, every one of them amazing, sweet, encouraging, convicting, all the rest. But so you address one another in psalms, and that's one of the reasons we're going to look at this psalm here, because you can apply it to your own life and maybe, hopefully, address it to somebody else who has need of it tomorrow or during the week. You address one another in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, and giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And we can't miss verse 22. Wives, then submit to your husbands as to the Lord. No, we didn't. Forget that. Don't forget that, but you know what I mean. Here's the thing. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart. We see that and understand that as not a new, just a New Testament thing, okay? It's not just something New Testament. 
it's not something old, just Old Testament, though we, though we see it all throughout the Old Testament. In Psalm 100, a favorite of mine, make a what? A joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. In other words, listen, you don't have to be able to sing in tune, on time, in time, whatever it is, you know, how to know when to refrain and, and what a refrain is. You know what I mean? You don't need to know any of these things. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. And with that, listen, serve the Lord with gladness. I mean, think about that. Gosh, maybe that's a great one just to remember. You know, there, there's songs that contain these lines. You know, learn them. You know, or just memorize this. And when you're on your way to church and you're about to do things for the Lord, whatever the case may be, maybe it's just going to work and, and you and you're, want to serve the Lord as you would serve, or serve your, your boss as you would serve the Lord as it's scriptural. Listen, to, to do it with gladness. But here's another one. Come into his presence with singing. How about this one? Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, blessing his name, giving thanks to him. For the Lord is good. He's worthy of it. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness is to all generations. So his steadfast love is, endures forever, so that includes today. His faithfulness is to all generations, so that includes us today. And so we are to be those that love and that sing and that praise and that, that willingly and joyfully bless the Lord's name. And that is, if anybody knows and has studied and looked at the life of David at all, that's exactly who he was. He wrote so many, the majority of the Psalms, you know. He was known for his playing his harp and, and singing and, and worshiping and just, he was a worshiper. And so, again, the thought... Ephesians 5.19 and other verses like that containing, you know, how we're to worship with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and such things. At the same time, all the Old Testament references, they're not just Old Testament and New Testament things, but they are just who God's people are kind of things. Who we are to be. We are to be worshipers. As God's given us a reason to worship. And so the question for us is, you know, are you a worshiper? Is worship something that you love, that you desire? You know, is it is it something that you can do, or that that you that you must do? You know, I mean, it's just like we were talking about it last night. How you know, uh, I since Sunday morning I played that song. Some of you heard it, I played that song, and and it just was was hard to do with Jason's guitar because I'm not used to it. And it just felt really low. I don't know why. He said, no, it's not. And I trust him because he knows not a lot more than me. And, and I checked out my guitars. They are tuned to the right. But I don't know. Maybe this was an off morning. I don't know. But when I sang the song, it was just, it's just, it wasn't right. And I love it. I love that song. So last night, Jack was there. It was just us, you know. And I, I was like, hey, I'm going to play you that song. I'm going to show you I can do it, you know. And, uh, but at the same time, I love it. I love it. And it's like, and he's like, how do you do that? How do you just write a song? It's like, you know, most of the time, it's something that God has put in my heart. It's just the Lord put it in my heart. Not a day goes by, not a day goes by that I don't need you. You know, I remember that line just going through my head as I was praying for things with the church, things with our, in our, with our, with our, with Nicole and, and God's hand and Lord and how we need you and just, and you guys, and God is so faithful. And those words just came to mind. And next thing you know, they're going through my head. Next thing you know, there's more and just kind of flowing. I just started writing it all down on my phone that night. And, and Kim was there and I kept leaving. I'll be right back. And like, you know, all of a sudden just something else is there. And, but I think, I'm, think that, I'm thinking, I don't know, but I'm thinking that that's how these things were for David. How did he write all these Psalms? You know what? He had a living, breathing, active, sweet Intimate relationship with God. In Jesus Christ, but didn't know that. Didn't, could not understand the, the relationship with the Savior, but that there would be one, because it was prophesied. He knew that. He wrote about it. And so in this place, you guys, for we who are worshipers, here's something that worship will do. And again, understanding this as a song of, of the ascent, I want to read you real quick something that Charles Spurgeon wrote here. He, he said this, he said this is, of this psalm, he said, this is one of the shortest psalms to read, but one of the longest psalms that you will ever learn. It speaks of a young child, but it contains in it the experience of a man in Christ. 
And you'll see that. It speaks of a young child, but really it's the experience of a man, what happens inside a man in Christ. Inside a real man in Christ, he realizes he is just but a child. And the identification is clear as we go through this. And so it's, it's written in a song of the ascent by David. And so it's written then, as we've mentioned, from David's personal experience. But it's been retained, it's been recorded, it's, and it's remembered here by us for our personal experience. So it's from personal experience for personal experience, which is what so much of the scripture is. It's just men writing about the experiences of their lives that we might read from them and, and apply these truths of God's word to the experience of our lives. And so we could say the experiences of our trials. And so look at verse 1. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I, couldn't, I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and I have quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, Hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Again, David's the king, and, and it isn't a command, but, it, but it's way beyond a suggestion. As he tells Israel, hope in the Lord. The things that you're going through, whoever was around at this time when David wrote this, they knew. They would have known the things that he was going through. Some of the more personal things, maybe not, but those that were that were national things, those that were you know out in front as the things that are the, the, the things of those who are out in front seem to get put out there for people to see and to hear. But they would have known, and and so David in this place, in verse one, he's saying basically, this is where I'm at. This is this is where I am at. Uh, oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. It's like he's. It's like a. It's like a, a prayer to the Lord, understanding God. I, I'm. I'm being honest here. I, I'm. I'm. I'm being as close to good and right and true as I can. God, my heart is not lifted up. He's being accused by others of thinking he's all that. My eyes are, you know, from Saul to Michael, his wife, whoever it was, you know, I'm, my heart is not lifted up. I'm not prideful, and, and my eyes are not raised too high. Not thinking I'm better. I mean, again, same sort of accusations that, that we will face at times. People thinking you think you're better because of your relationship with the, with the Lord. Uh, but hey, you know, I'm not lifted up. I'm just in the place where, God, you've placed me where you've called me. And my eyes aren't raised too high. I mean, you know, you could look at that and some could say, you know, you, you, you know your people have coined the phrase, what is it, you're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good? Listen, my thought would be this, you guys, with God, you can never raise your eyes high enough. For those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, those of us that are worshipers of Jesus Christ, it's not because we're better, we're not lifted up, but He lifts us up. And my eyes can never be raised too high because he is the highest of all. But he invites us to that place. And then so with all that, with all the accusations against him and all that there were that we don't know, but we've, we've tasted in our own lives from time to time in different ways. He says this, and this is where, you guys, this is where, this is so important because this is where our victory lies in so many ways. This is, this is key to where I am at. David would say and how I get through that and, and same for you with your that he says in the midst of verse 1 I do not occupy myself with things too great and things too marvelous for me it can be translated you know I don't occupy myself with things too big for me I love another translation. The New American Standard says, I do not involve myself in great matters or things too difficult for me. I mean, David's a king. And so he's got difficult things that he has to deal with. But he's not going to let his heart be occupied with them. He's not going to let himself be controlled by them. He's not going to let himself... In another translation, I do not concern myself with, with things too great or too marvelous, too big for me to grasp. 
Why is that? Because as soon as I start concerning myself and, and I'm occupied by these things, I will be consumed by them. In Psalm 73, and you can turn there if you want, real quickly. In Psalm 73, the psalmist Asaph, he's going through the ringer. He's, Asaph is a prophet. He's a poet. He was the worship leader appointed by David under David. And he writes this psalm. And you got to know, you know, I mean, we don't know for sure. Maybe it was Asaph's wife that heard this psalm, you know, sung for the first time. You know, and just probably if she did, just like, oh my gosh, this is our life story. This is what we're going through right now. And then all of a sudden he comes to the middle of the psalm and, and her eyes are open, like yours and mine, even as we will read these things. He says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. You know, hey, they're good. You know, but as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And so he's honest. He had his eyes on others. He was, he was occupied by things. In my Bible here, uh, the, in verse 1, you don't need to turn back there, but I'm sorry, in verse 1 in the midst, that middle verse where it says, I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. It, it reads this way if you just stop it with the one line. I do not occupy myself with things. You guys, if you're occupied with things, you know, you're going to end up in this kind of place. Where the world is, seeing the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pangs of death. Their bodies are, are fat and sleek. I mean, who is that? This guy, see, he's, he's thinking, they're fat and sleek. How do you be fat and sleek? It's like, whoa, sleek, but a little heavy. I was like, I mean, it's like, he, so he's confused, is all I can say. He says, look at, and here he's looking at the world. They're not in trouble as others are. He's, he's thinking as I am. They're not stricken like the rest of mankind. That's the, the wicked. He's like, why not just be like those guys hanging out at the bar? They seem happy. You know, their pride is their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes swell, uh, it says, their eyes swell out through fatness and their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threat, threaten oppression. So these guys are angry, mean. It's like, how come they're not in trouble? They set their mouths against the heavens. And their tongues strut through the earth. You look at many within the media that mock Christians and, and those that are, would be born again. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. He says, basically, the proud and the violent, and it's amazing, you know, that the people, the world will follow. Look, it says, they say, you know, how can God know? You know, I mean, get in your face. You're a Christian. How does God know? You think God knows these things? Is there knowledge in the Most High? That's what the wicked with those who strut about will say. You know, you think God knows everything. You think that you get wisdom and, oh, you know, I mean, they question, they question God and here he's in this place and he says, behold, these things are the wicked and they're always at ease. They increase in riches. They're doing good, Lord. And he says, verse 13, here it is. He says, all in vain have I kept my heart clean. He says, I've washed my hands in innocence. I've been doing what I should do, trying to follow the Bible, doing everything that I'm supposed to do, Lord. He says, for all day long I've been stricken. I've been rebuked every morning. I'm trying so hard, and these guys have got so things so easy. He says, but if I would have said this, he says, verse 15, if I had said, I will speak thus. I'm going to talk about this. Then I would have betrayed the generation of your children. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like the, the place of, a, in a sense, the role of a pastor, you know. It's not for me to, to, to whine at you guys and, and to, to complain about the things that i got to deal with and go through in my life. And surely I'm going to bring things up and share them along the way to under, help you to understand that, that we're all the same. But at the same time, I'm not going to question God in front of you. I'm not going to question God before you. And, and why is that? Because I'm going to have my Bible open. When is it that I would speak thus myself? When is it that I would question God as your pastor? When is it that that could happen? When I'm going through things in my life, when I've got my eyes on the prosperity of the wicked, what everybody else is doing, when I'm occupied with things, whether it's things of the world or things that are just too great, too big for me, 
when it comes to the job that God's given me, that God's given you in your home and whatever it is. And, and so he's in a place where he's, 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 he's tweaked. He's just trying to figure things out. And then, so he says, he's, he's just honest. I love verse 16. He says, but when I thought, how do, how do I understand this? It seemed to me a wearisome task. You know, the idea is, listen, you never will. You will never understand all this. But as we mentioned on Sunday morning, you know, Proverbs 9, 10, B. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So Proverbs 9, 10. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And, and so when I try to understand this on my own, it's a wearisome task. But if I get to the Holy One, I gain understanding. And that's what happens here. Look, he says, when I tried to understand all this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. And my own. All of a sudden, you know, when you, always, when you get into the Word, you become to, into the sanctuary of God's Holy Word. When you read your Bible, all of a sudden you, you, you begin to understand and you trust God. And by the end of the, he says, surely you're placing them on slippery places. I don't even see it, but I know they are. You will make them fall to ruin. They will be destroyed in a moment like a dream when one awakes. He goes through all of this. He says, verse 21, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in my heart, I was stupid. Basically, he says, I was stupid. I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guys, even though you're being stupid, embittered, pricked in heart, ignorant, like a beast towards God, He's still with you. He's still with you. It's like, you know, that, that one line from the song I, I sang on Sunday. Again, in fact, I got it right here. I just remembered because I forgot what I was going to share. Oh, yeah, here. You know, so many times I've walked ahead so many times I've missed your path. I've wasted precious time. So much precious time. But there you are. There you always are. Forever faithful God. That's our Lord, you guys. And in the psalm, understand this. When he shows up, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. Verse 23, you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will receive me into glory. Whom I have in heaven but you, there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. You guys, that's when we run into trouble. When all of a sudden the things of earth become the desires of our heart. When the things that are in front of us, rather than the one who has called us, become our desires, that's when we're in trouble. And the amazing thing of all of it is this, you guys. When you come to the sanctuary of the Lord, all of a sudden you realize there's guidance there. There's counsel there. Our Lord is there, and you realize He's had your hand the whole time. You hold my right hand. And the, and the, the most amazing thing of all, you receive me into glory. God is going to receive us into glory. No matter what your sin is. Listen, David, he was an adulterer. He was a murderer. And... and and the Lord still names him after that, calls him a man after his own heart. Why? Because he repented. Listen, if you need to repent tonight, repent. If there's things you need to confess, confess. Get it over. Get it done. You know? It, it, don't let yourself be in that place where the things of the earth occupy you so greatly that you miss the blessing of God. And so, again, explaining where he's at, I'm, you know, I'm not occupying myself. I'm not concerned with, I'm not caught up in the things that are too big for me. Too much for me to understand. Too marvelous for me. And so he says, but, so what does he do? How, how, does he, how do you not be occupied with those things? How do you do that? You've got stuff that is important. You've got, you know, doctor visits. You've got, you know, bills coming up and and money's not coming in or whatever the issues and struggles of life are you know, broken relationships what do you do with it how do you not occupy how does it not how does it not you know take you over he tells us in verse 2 but i have quieted my soul i've calmed and i've quieted my soul like a weaned child with its a weaned child with its mother like a weaned child is my soul within me 
How do you get to that kind of place, that degree of calmness before God when you're dealing with Saul wanting to kill you? Your wife, Michael, calling you crazy and undignified. You're no king. When you deal with your son, Absalom, who wants your throne and, and at the same time, you know, murderers to rapists to, I mean, just ridiculous, the things that the sons of David did. The struggles of being a father and, and all those things and then and not, and not only that but to be occupied with the with the role of, of being the king over this nation. The nation that by the time he would hand it over to Solomon, Solomon would say, you know, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I feel like a little child, you know, and and you know, how do I how do I govern this great people of yours? I mean that was his desire. He would show me, teach me how do I how do I lead? You know, I think the Lord would say, remember what your father used to do? Remember, you know, remember what the, those things that your father taught you? How did he calm and how did he quiet his soul? How do you not let the things of the earth overtake you? In Psalm 119, you guys, can it, can it even be done? You think about it. You know, how can, how can you ever get past some things? Well, In Psalm 119, verse 9, the psalmist writes, How can a young man keep his way pure? I mean, that's a huge one. That's got to be one of the the biggest battles of life when it comes to a young man and his life, and especially even more so in this day and age. You can say, how can anyone keep their way pure? But how can a young man with all the testosterone and all the, the, the wackiness and, and, and things laid in front of them, friends encouraging them to them and all that, how can he keep his way pure? There's no way. You know, listen, no, there is a way. By guarding it according to your word. How do you guard, how do you guard your life according to God's word? And this is for any of us. Here it is. With my whole heart, I seek you. You know, you don't, you don't come half-hearted. You get all in for the Lord. And then when you fall out, as we always do, listen, you don't say, oh, I failed, so I give up. No, I failed, so now I'm going to get back in line and I'm going to commit my whole heart to the Lord to seek Him. He says, listen, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I mean, again, the commandments of God, oh my gosh, the commandments. His commandments, remember, His commands are not burdensome. How do you know that? Because you know what? If you, you would know it. You, you'll only know it if you want to, but if you want to, you will know it. His commands aren't burdensome. You get into the Word, it's like, and I want to do the things that God calls me to do. You care about it. That's why Paul would write, hey, the things that I want to do, I don't do, but the things I, I, I do do, I don't want to do. And he's in that place of, you know, confusion. And, but listen, but his heart is there. And the one that saves that whole heart is the one that calls us. And look at this again as well, and so important, guarding your heart according to the word, with my whole heart seeking you. Verse 11, Psalm 119, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Storing up the word of God. I have hidden your word in my heart is another translation of that, but I love it, stored up. You know, do you have God's word in storage? You know, is... Is it in your? Is it it stored up in your heart, or is it in storage? You know, it's like, oh well, I've got. I don't know where my Bible is. It's somewhere. Where's my Bible? Have you seen my Bible? You know, it's like stored up word. You guys store up the word. Where do you store up the word? You know what? You do it here on Wednesday nights. You do it on Sunday mornings. You do it when you get up in the morning and open up your Bible. You do it whenever you can. You get into God's Word, and next thing you know, it's there in your heart. And when you need it, God will grab that Scripture out of storage. And He brings it to mind. Because it's been hidden. It's there in your heart where He dwells. And so if He dwells in your heart, and you're going through some time of life where you're occupied with things greater, it's like, and you've stored God's Word in your heart, and He lives there. Remember, you are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit now. It's like you're going through that situation and it's like all of a sudden the Lord there, Holy Spirit in your heart, He, he grabs that scripture and he, and, he, and he 
hands it up, and he gives it right up to you. Here, here's what you need right now. And all of a sudden, into your mind pops what, some thought that's right, that's good. What do you do? You embrace it. You grab a hold of it, and grab it quick. Because the enemy's going to come again with something to occupy your mind. Something too great for you, too, too big for you, too marvelous in a sense is another translation. But you guys, we have to, we have to take part in that. I have calmed and I have quieted my soul. The Lord does the work, but, but we need to get into the Word. And what is the result? Again, I'm going through this. I'm not going to be occupied with it, but I'm calming my heart. I'm calming my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Guys, a weaned child with its mother, what is that? It's a child that's at peace, you know? I mean, the, the New American Standard reads there like a, like a weaned child resting with its mother. I mean, it's, it's, it's at rest. When a child has been weaned, look, like a, a weaned child is my soul within me. What has a weaned child got? It's got a full tummy. It's full, a weaned child is here, it is, it is full of milk. And so it's content. A weaned child full of milk, well, what is that? It's like we've talked about it on Sunday as well, how, you know, the, how the Apostle Paul said, hey, you know, some of you should be teachers right now, but you're not ready because you're, you're stuck on only milk, but you, you can't even eat the meat, the, the deep things of God, because, again, because people's focus and heart wasn't on the work of God. And, and I think for us, you guys, we need the milk. We talked about that as well. Just the sweetness of being able to be in a Bible study and, and hear the gospel, how, how Jesus died on the cross for our sins, how he loved us, how he, he knew the hurt and the pain that you're going through and the, the guilt and the confusion of our sin that it brings upon us. And, and he took that on himself and he died for us because he loves us. And then as he died, as he had his arms stretched out, what did he cry out to the Father? Not just for those that were there, but, but echoing his heart for all of creation. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And for all that would come to him and call on his name, he wants to bring this rest. And, and that's that milk, just that sweetness of the gospel that brings contentment. And a weaned child as well, listen, content in their mother's arms has no worries. No worries. They're, 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 they're well fed. And, 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 and the Lord becomes that meat and that drink and, and fills our soul. Again, understanding our place before the Lord is that place of a child. It doesn't matter if you are an elder in the church. You know, It doesn't matter if, if you are... I was going to say the Pope, but that would be a scary place. Don't ever be the Pope, even if they offer, okay? <laughs> but no matter how high and lofty a position even you might hold in the world's eyes in, in the, the house of God or something, you know, whatever it is, you're still just a child. You're still, you're still completely dependent on Him. And, and there is nothing, listen... There is no man that can handle the concerns of all things. We weren't meant to. We weren't created to. There are things in your life and mine that are too great and too big, too, too marvelous for you. And you might think, well, but God put me in this position. Yeah, He put you there that you might de be dependent on Him all the more. Like a weaned child. And again, He's, he's saying here, this is where I'm at and this is how I, I, I get there. How I live with the great pressures of, of life in serving God. I mean, I, I don't know that David even understood these things, you know, that the way they'd be perceived by others as they would read them thinking of him. But looking back on David's life where we have the fullness of it here now, you know, he was a man that, that lived his life serving God with all his own struggles and battles, and, and he gives us insight into a time of victory, okay? Not concerning himself with things too great and too marvelous, but calming his heart and calming and quieting his soul. And so we know that he has victory here at this moment. But you guys, there's plenty of other times in David's life where he struggled. 
because he was a man. He was just a man. But he, I'm sure, you know, as we know the story, he got right back to where he needed to be. And maybe even, just a thought, at times, when he was hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of his sin, as that one song sings, he opened up his book of Psalms that he's written, his scroll, and he opened up the scroll, and with God's perfect timing, with the Spirit's direct leading, there he is, and he, and he saw God's Word written by his hand there, and he was, and he's set free. You ever have that happen? You open up God's Word, and, and, and you, you find a place that you've highlighted and underlined, and it's just like something that, that's been a part of your life. You didn't write it, but, but surely you've responded to it before and now you're reminded of it. And that personal experience that was another's, that was a brother from the past, all of a sudden brings life and light to you and I for my personal experience that I'm dealing with right now. And I can't tell you how many times and how grateful I am that the Lord has done that so many times in my life and that He has that for every one of us. I mean, that's... That's another part of the gospel, you know, is that good news that God's word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's for everyone. And so he shares his heart, and then at the end, he, 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 he makes the call to the people that he leads. You know, he's, this, is, this is what I do. I don't, I, don't, I don't occupy myself. I don't concern myself with all these things that are too great and too marvelous for me. But I calm myself and I quiet myself like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child, my soul within me. And, he's, and his desire is for his people. That's why God chose him, because he saw that he was a man after his own heart. And, and he had a desire for the people. And he says, Oh Israel, hope in the Lord. Oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And so, Oh Israel, be occupied with the Lord. What's, where's your hope? You know, put your name in there. Oh Steve, you know. Oh Conrad, Ho hope in the Lord. You guys, this is something that we can pass on to others. Is the Lord your hope? You guys, He is hope. He's not just your hope. He's, he is hope. He is the hope of the world. You know, Christmas is coming. I wore my Christmas shirt. <laughs> it's red. I don't know. Um, the hopes and fears of all the years. We're met in thee tonight. I mean, you guys, listen. It's, it's uh, ho all our hopes, all our fears. They're, they're met with the one that, that can overcome them all in Jesus Christ. He wants to be your hope so that you might not be weary of soul. He wants to be your, the place where, you are, where you're occupied with him. Listen, don't ever, don't ever give up hope because the hope of the Lord is, he says it, as we close out this verse and this night, listen, it's from this time on, from this time forth, and forevermore. What you're going through right now, the struggles and the battles that are ahead and that are right in front of you today, they, and, and forevermore, your hope is the Lord. Our hope is Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground, listen, is too great and too marvelous for me. I can't occupy myself with all those things, with the sinking sand and the ground around, but, but I need to occupy myself on the rock. The hope that is Jesus Christ. Don't ever give up hope. Be that one that clings to the rock. So listen, what are, what, are you, what are you occupied with in your life? When it comes to the battles and the things of your life today, that what you're facing, each one of us, you all got different things that you're dealing with and facing all the time. And some seems like it is just that same thing all the time, that nothing's changing. Are there things that you've dealt with before that you, know, you thought would never change, but they changed? 
God took you through a season. I wrote a thing on that today. I've been working on Christmas Eve and just some thoughts and things for that. And wrote a ton of stuff today. And just thinking about seasons and how seasons come and seasons go. And, and seasons are needed. You know, and there's seasons that you don't like. And some people, they love the snow. And some people, they can't wait for the snow to be gone. Some people are praying for a storm and rain. And others are praying, please don't let it rain anymore, you know. Some people love the sun. And others are trying to get out of the, to get to the shade and get to a place where it's cool. And, and some people can't wait for the night for things to cool off. But others are afraid of the night because of what? is there and waits them and all the thoughts that are there and they can't wait for the morning but others are so afraid of the morning because they have to deal with the day and it's like it's like around and around we go and where it stops nobody knows no Jesus Christ knows I love it I, I, got, I, would read, I wrote so much stuff on that today it blows my mind because we are so dependent on this one that's given us this book to tell us I'm here I'm here I've got you would you please trust me? Would you please calm and quiet your soul? Would you come to me like a weaned child with its mother? Would you let me quiet your soul within you? The only way is that if you are occupied with him. We know and we've heard it before and they talk about it in, in and around Israel. Occupied territory. You know? We think of it as the area that the enemy has, you know, often. Is it occupied territory? Who occupies the territory? Listen, is your heart occupied territory? Yeah, surely it is. But it's just a question of what's, what your heart occupies, who your heart is occupied by. Is it Jesus Christ? He wants to be. He wants to be there. He wants to be your hope from this time on and forevermore. Listen, so many of us have grabbed a hold from this time right now. All right, Lord, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Well, hang on from this time forth and forevermore. We need to trust Him tomorrow with everything that He showed us and gave us today and, and the things of the past. We have, we have the testimonies of the saints. We can go to Hebrews chapter 11 and, and read many of them there. You know, just get the, the it's like the cliff notes of, of victors of the Bible in a sense almost. You know, surely He couldn't contain them all, but, 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 but many sweet victors of over things and stress and trials of life in Hebrews chapter 11. And we can go there and we can look at that. Or if you've been a Christian for long at all, you can look back at things where God has delivered you, where he has brought healing, where he has carried and, and brought hope. And, and maybe things didn't change and come the way that you would have hoped, but you know what? You're on the other side of it now. And, and it, the way that it happens, again, is living in the occupied territory of the Word of God. You know, beyond, again, how can a young man keep his way pure? But to the point of, of for all men, for all women, storing up in our hearts God's Word. Not only that we might not sin against Him, but that we might have the strength that we need in Him. Again, from this time forth and forevermore. Listen, don't occupy yourself with the things of this world that are too great for you. Things you can't handle. Every one of us. I look at my life and I look at... I mean, I, don't, I could not tell you how many times it's come to ministry and church and, and the finances and things that are too big for me. How do you just make, you can't, I can't just make these things happen. And it's like, but, but I've been occupied with them. I've been concerning myself with things. And surely we have to think about them. Even as David had to think about the things of a king, right? You can't just like, la, 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 God's going to take care of it. But, but, but I'm not to be occupied. I can't not to be overwhelmed with it. Remember, listen, even as, as David's ministry as a king was given to him, my life, your life, What's on your plate has been given to you. The Lord knew. The Lord knows. We talked about it on Sunday. We're talking about it today. You know, it's like, you know, the Lord, He, He will weep with those that weep. I believe that the Lord mourns with us as we're mourning. He weeps with us. He hurts with us and he hurts for us as he sees us weep and all that with all my heart. I know that he does. 
I know that he does because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as I read the Bible and I look at Jesus, I know who he was and I know who he still is. At the same time, I know that as he's given me a burden and you a burden for others and a heart that breaks for others in the place that they're at, that brings you to tears, I know it does the same with him. We were created in his image. And so he will be with there. He will mourn with you. He will weep with you. He will, he will, he will, he will laugh with you. I'm sure there's many times that you got, you've just been touched and blessed and laughing and the Lord is like so blessed. Like when you, when you and I see, I mean, when, I remember we were driving to the other side the other day and I said, I, we had Riley and, and I would say Tyler with us. It was Riley and Liam with us. And I said, hey, let's all laugh right now. I'm like, what? And Riley's like, I don't want to laugh. I'm like, yeah, well, we're going to laugh. And we just started fake laughing. Like, ha, ha, ha. I mean, that's how they do the whole holy laughter thing. I mean, it's not God going, oh, I'm going to make you all like, fall around on the floor. We just started laughing. Next thing you know, we were all cracking up hysterically. Just for nothing. No good reason. And, but, but just joy. And I guarantee you that the Lord enjoyed us enjoying that time of laughter. And so the Lord will weep with you. He'll mourn with you. He'll rejoice with you. But listen, he will never worry with you. He won't worry. He's not, he won't worry with you, okay? He's like, no, no, no. I know it's going to happen. I have a plan for you. I have a plan for this. My love is greater. Don't concern yourself. Don't occupy yourself with these things. But give them to me. Calm your soul. Quiet your soul. Come and, and, and rest with me. Like a weaned child, may your soul be with me. Hope in the Lord, O Israel. Hope in the Lord, O Calvary Chapel, and O whoever is watching or listening tonight. This time forth and forevermore. That's our God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you so much, God, for just... Uh, Lord, I don't know how this touched or moved or ministered to anybody here tonight, for sure, and you do. It's your word, but God, you know how it's encouraged me. And Lord, I just pray that, uh, that these guys would be touched with even just a bit of that. Lord, uh, it, it would be fullness. Lord, you're so good. You love us. You desire for us not to be focused on the heaviness and the weight of things, but to look at you who can carry anything. There's nothing too big for you to reach and, and grab and, and lift there before us that we might pass through. There's nothing too heavy that that you would have to look for help ever because, Lord, you are the help. You are our help. And you're the one that can move mountains. And so, Lord, we ask you, Lord, even as that song sings, we, we've, we've seen you do it before. We'll see you do it again, Lord. Uh, do these great things in our lives. Calm, God, would you please calm and quiet the souls of any here tonight that need that. And Lord, give us these words to pass on to others in the days ahead that they might be lifted up out of the muck, out of the miry clay, even as David, the writer of this psalm, was and set on a rock. Lord, that is you, Jesus. And we ask you these things and we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, so next week, read ahead. We'll be back in Numbers chapter... Three, I think, right? Yes, Numbers chapter 3.